Barnabas um, as they were called and sent out in partnership with the church and with the Holy Spirit. This is from Acts chapter 13 and 14. Remember when we began this ser series, the very beginning, the title of it was uh, Acts, God's Unfinished Book. Um, so this, was the, this is the overall title, and it's called God's Unfinished Book because the command and the sending out that Jesus gave to his disciples is still valid today for you and me. So God's call to us is the same call. Uh, the ministry that Jesus has for us is still the same ministry. Brothers and sisters, the equipping that Jesus has for the work that he's called us to do is still the same equipping. It's through the power of the Holy Spirit. That hasn't changed and we can't do it any other way. And the needs are still the same, so the call is still the same, and the work is unfinished. And so that's why I called Acts, the Acts of the Apostles, God's unfinished book. And so here we are in the, uh, right at the middle of the book, because Acts has 28 chapters, and we're in chapter 14, and we'll start moving faster after we, uh, as we finish up here already, uh, two chapters, three weeks, that's pretty, fa that's pretty fast. But there is still no, there's no change in what God has called people to do, what he's called us to do. So we're following Paul and Barnabas as they've been called out to, uh, the, remember the Holy Spirit said, set apart for me Paul and Barnabas for the work to which I have called them. And remember we talked about this. This meant that the Holy Spirit had already spoken to Paul and Barnabas. Then he confirmed it to the church but to be sure, they prayed again to make sure they had heard from God. If we, if we drag our heels and slow down because we don't want to obey God's call, then there's a problem. But if we slow down and pray and really seek God to make sure of God's call, that's fine. And we know that that happened in this case because the Holy Spirit confirmed it to the church and they sent them out. They prayed and fasted again. They laid hands on them and sent them out. So that's what we have been, that's what we've been following. And they go out and they're partnered with their church and they're partnered with the Holy Spirit. How are they partnered with the church in Antioch? Because they don't have Skype. They don't have Facebook. You know, we are so, we are so we get instant gratification. You know, something happens in the Philippines in one of the ministries, and they send it to us, and we put it up. Uh, we put it up. And we say, "See, he look, look what, look what's happening." We all, we all get excited. That would not have happened with uh, Paul and Barnabas and the church. Uh, it would have been they send them out. And a year and a half, maybe two years later, then they come back and then they find out this is what happened. So what was the partnership of the Antioch Church? Brothers and sisters, the partnership of the Antioch Church is the same partnership that you and I have can have today in the work of God, in the ministry of God, and in the missions of God. And that is a partnership of prayer. And you may say, well, yeah, but where does it say that they continued to pray for them? I think this is one of the places in the Bible, though it is not specifically stated, you can absolutely assume without fear and without, uh, without thinking, well, I'm reading something into it and I'm messing up maybe what the Bible is saying. You can assume and count on the fact that the church in Antioch was praying for Paul and Barnabas as, and John Mark as they, as they went out. There's no question because they were already, it was in a prayer meeting and then it was out of a prayer meeting. May I say to you that if you are looking for a place to serve in Lighthouse, you're looking for a place of ministry, but you don't know where you fit or what you can do, may I tell you, may I give you a place where you will always fit, where there is always a need where your service will always bring fruit and where you will always be rewarded for what you do. You know where that is? Prayer. Very simply, prayer. Some of you have urgings and calls. I'd like to be involved in missions. I'd like to go. And you can't go because of your work or maybe because of your families or maybe because of your financial limitations. Now, God can take care of those things as you continue to seek him. But what I want to say to you is this. Where you are right now, what you are right now, you can be involved in missions and evangelism and the work of God through prayer. 
always. It is one of the most rewarding parts of work. It is one of the most fruitful parts of God's work. And I guarantee you that one day you will have part of the reward from the Lord. He will honor you and he will reward you for your, for your part, for your service in prayer. I believe that's what the Antioch church was doing. So you can always involve yourself in God's work through prayer. Amen? Amen. Amen. That was a little bit weak. Nevertheless, it's true, right? Never the, aim. Thank you. Amen. Amen. Um, I, I can, let me give you an example. Um, you know some of the things that's going, on with my, that's going on with my family now with dad and the stroke. And so mom is there and she's taking care of dad. And my sister is away from her own home and is down taking care of dad, although she's not always able to be there. And so I've been, I can't be there at this present time. I'll be going uh, before too long. But I can't be there in person. I can't help. I can't, I can't do these practical things. But what the Holy Spirit has really shown me is I can pray. And so I've spent much, much more time in prayer for them and for the situation. And I know God is working and I know God is doing something in answer to prayer. Um, it's still, I would like to, I would like to be there to, to be able to do things, but this is my part. And then when I talk with them, do you know what they say? My sister told me, she said, Jennifer, she said, I'll be really honest with you. I don't have a lot of t time to pray right now. She said, cause it's up early and it's late at night and I'm helping mom. And she said, but I can feel people praying. And mom has said that. She said, I can feel people praying. Brothers and sisters, all of the action in God's church and in God's house is not always out there doing it. A lot of times it's on our knees. It's on our knees. So I encourage you to, to consider that if you haven't before. Be part of the work of God through prayer. Through prayer. I think that's what the Antioch church was doing. And we can involve ourselves in, in ministry that way. So Paul and Barnabas are out on their evangelistic outreach. Think about what we've already talked about thus far. They have encountered demonic opposition. Uh, by the way, as I was studying, I began to see something. Um, they don't, do you know, when it's people talking against Paul and Barnabas and slander and accusation, Paul and Barnabas, it's not even called persecution. Now, I don't know about you, but if somebody slanders me, I call it persecution. Don't you? Yeah, we do. If somebody's speaking ill of us and this and that, I feel persecuted. I feel persecuted. From what I can see in the book of Acts, Paul and Barnabas don't even count that as persecution. They talk about opposition, but persecution is not, that word's not even used until it starts to get physical. You know, they're run out of town, or stones are thrown at them, or things happen. And I thought, oh Lord, my... <laughs> My, my level of, of, of uh, strength in fighting for you is, is a little bit wimpy compared to Paul and Barnabas. Maybe a lot of us would feel that way as well um, to, to when we think about it. I, who, who can imagine the things that were said about Paul and Barnabas? But anyhow, they are opposed by a demonic power, a force, a sorcerer in, in Paphos. That's number one. Number two, they get as far as Pisidian Antioch, and in Pisidian Antioch, they face opposition also. That's in your, that's in your notes. Um, and then that's where they're slandered, um, and that's where finally persecution arises. Then they go to the next city, Iconium, and the same thing happens again. And I was thinking about that, and I thought, well, Lord, how do they, how do they keep... There we go. Okay, look with me just a minute. So the first one, they're, they're, uh, they have demonic opposition, and it says, then Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, looked straight at Elimus the sorcerer, sorcerer and said, you're a child of the devil and an enemy of everything that is right. We couldn't get away with that in most churches today, could we? But I want to encourage you, he was full of the Holy Spirit. Okay, this is the direction of the Holy Spirit. Then he gets to Pisidian Antioch, he preaches, and they begin to slander him there. And Paul and Barnabas answered them boldly and said, this is what God has told us to do. And then the third place in Iconium, uh, opposition arises again, similar to this place. 
And what does the Bible say? It says, so Paul and Barnabas spent considerable time there speaking boldly for the Lord. And I was so encouraged by that because it, reminded, it reminds me and it should remind us that they're in partnership with the Holy Spirit as they go. How are you and I going to do what God has called us to do? How are we going to be bold when people slander us? How are we going to be confident when people question who we are and what we do? When people may say, oh, you call yourself a Christian? Has anybody ever said that to you? Ha! Yeah. Ah, all of you went, ha, ah, yeah. You call yourself a Christian, but how are we going to stand in, a, in the face of that? Look at this. We know who we are, we know God's calling on our lives, and we're in partnership with the Holy Spirit. Does that make sense? I'm so encouraged when I look at Paul and Barnabas. Here's opposition. Here is, here is demonic opposition. Here are people attacking them. But because they know God has called them, and they know that they're in partnership with the Holy Spirit, they can be bold. When we know our calling, and when we know our equipping in God, we can be confident and bold whatever we face whatever we face you and I think listen you and I think well if I do it just right and if I'm perfect then people can't speak against me first of all you'll you're not going to be perfect till heaven there will be times when you slip up you won't always get it right same thing with me but my confidence and my boldness does not lie in my perfection, nor does yours. And you can be as good as you can be and as perfect as you can be. And I'll tell you right now, people are still going to slander you. And they're still going to say, you call yourself a Christian, right? So where does your confidence have to come from? How do you stand? It's going to have to be with the help of the Holy Spirit. That's, that's the only place, brothers and sisters. And Paul and Barnabas give us a great example of that. So... Paul and Barnabas, they have to leave Pisidian Antioch. Pisidian Antioch, remember, we'll look at the map in just a minute, but we looked at the map quite a lot before. They leave the island. Sergius Paulus, the governor, has family in Pisidian Antioch, and they go directly up to the mainland to Pisidian Antioch. But that's where the slander comes, and they're opposed, and then they have to leave there. They are run out of town. Have you ever been run out of town for being a Christian? I haven't either. I've been spoken against, but I haven't been run out of town. So they have to run out of town, but I'm a little bit worried about them because they're, I'm a little bit worried. Wouldn't you be worried? Because there are a lot of young new Christians in this place, these baby Christians. So the Jews stirred up the influential religious women. Uh, the relig influential religious women are the Greek and Roman women of the city, not Jewish not Jewish, who had political power and who, uh, who had political power in the cities? Not the Jews, not the Jews, but the Greeks and the Romans had political power. So what do the Jews do? They stir up those who do have influence and the leaders of the city and then they drive them out of town. So they run them out of town. Well, I'm a little bit worried. They're brand new Christians. How are they gonna make it? Don't worry. Do your part, but God takes care of his children. Because we read in verse 52, and the believers were what? Filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit. That lets you know it's the work of God and not the work of man. Do you know why? If it's the work of man, and if it depends on Paul and Barnabas, they're going to fall. These believers aren't going to make it because Paul and Barnabas have been run out of town and obviously there's opposition to the message of God. But verse 52, some of us, you didn't even pay attention to that when you read it the first time, did you? You just read it and you kept on going. There's a beautiful encouragement in verse 52. The believers were filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit. Remember Stephen when he was martyred and he was stoned to death? I can't imagine dying in that way. And it says, as Stephen is dying, as stones are hitting him and knocking him down and breaking his bones and bruising his body, it says, and Stephen, filled with the Holy Spirit, said, look, I see Jesus. I see Jesus. Brothers and sisters, 
the Holy Spirit will help you in hard times to see Jesus in spite of hard times, in, sp in spite of all your needs, in spite of all your difficulties. You're partnered with the Holy Spirit. He will help you lift your eyes above your problems. Are your problems still there? Sure, they're still there. They haven't disappeared with the wave of a wand, but the Holy Spirit is with you. And that's what we see also here in verse 52. The believers were filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit. I love that. I'm so encouraged when I read that. Okay, so then they are run out of town, poor Paul and poor Barnabas. Um, a mob is against them. And then they go on. So here's our map again. Remember they started here. They went to Salamis, Paphos, demonic sorcerer, Elimus. They went here and then immediate, immediately up to Pisidian Antioch. They're run out of town there, and where do they go next? They go to Iconium, okay? So they've gone this far. They've gone to Iconium, and you don't get as many details in Iconium because it says same thing happened in Iconium. So same thing happens here, similar to here. They went to the Jewish synagogue. They preached. Oh, here, this is great. They ran out of, they were run out of town, Pisidian Antioch, not in defeat, but they go to the next town and there's such great power in their preaching that a great number of Jews and Greeks became believers. Praise the Lord, okay? Why? This is God's mission. God has sent them out. So, so encouraging. Um, but since it's similar to Pisidian Antioch, some of the Jews spurn God's message again. Do you see the pattern? It's the Jews, and then they influence the Greeks, right? Right? That, so that's how. And they poison the minds of the Gentiles against them. Okay, so this happens. What do you think Paul and Barnabas will do next? Don't look at your Bible if you have it. What would be the next logical thing? They've poisoned the minds of the Gentiles against them. So what do Paul and Barnabas do? They have to run to the next town, right? Wrong! Those of us who know our Bibles, I love this. Look with me at verse 3. So, the apostles stayed there a long time. Oh, brothers and sisters, we get one whiff of opposition. Oh, God, help me, and we go running away. Paul and Barnabas, the, the, it's poisoned against them, and the Bible says, so they stayed there, and they preached a long time. Listen, I, I mean this. We're laughing, but it's really true. Sometimes opposition or, or rises against us, and you say, yeah, but I'm not a missionary. Take it out of that missions idea. Put it, in the, in the, put it in, the, in the framework of you're a Christian, and it may be in your business, it may be in your family, it may be among your friends, and you're trying to stand for God. You're trying to live for God, right? And people talk about you, and they mock you, and they say this, and they say that, and we feel like, oh, Lord, I feel defeated. I love this. Be encouraged by this this morning, because what we see here is they go in preaching boldly. God does a great work. Opposition rises, and instead of being deterred, instead of being dis uh, discouraged, instead they, boom, they move ahead. They stay there a long time. I believe many times the enemy comes against us and stirs up people against us when we're trying to work for God, when we're trying to live for God, precisely because he knows better than we do, if this person keeps on going this way, they're really going to do something for God. If this person keeps on going for God, they're going to influence others. They're going to have a breakthrough. And so the enemy tries to discourage us, doesn't he? He tries to keep us from breaking through. And I want to encourage you, brothers and sisters, this morning. Don't, when, when you feel opposition come against you, sometimes it's opposition that you see. Sometimes, let me be very specific here this morning and make it very practical for us this morning. Sometimes it may even be while you are praying and you're praying. How many of you have ever prayed and it was so hard to pray? Have you ever tried to pray and you just felt like your prayers went boop right there and you felt like God doesn't hear me, yeah? And you felt like this is pointless, yes? You felt like nothing is happening, why bother? and all I want to do is sleep. <laughs> do you know why you all laughed? Because you know it's true. 
And you know why I said it? Because I'm the same way. You think the enemy attacks you, m me any differently than you? Same thing for me as well. I want to encourage you, brothers and sisters, this morning, when opposition begins to arise, when, 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 when these things begin to happen, even in simple ways like prayer, or sometimes even in a service, even in a service. Do you all remember last week when I stood up and I, was it last week? I think it was last week, and I said, folks, let's stand against it, fight. Stand in the Lord. And God helped us, didn't he? It's because the enemy is putting up a, a roadblock to keep us from the blessing of God and the pouring out of his resources and his help that are just there, that are just there. And he knows if he can stop us and discourage us, at that point, we're not going to push through and we're not going to receive what God has for us just right there. I believe that. I have seen that time and time again. I've seen it in my own life as well. So let's learn a lesson from Paul and Barnabas. Does that make sense to you this morning? I encourage you then, the next time you feel really, really discouraged in prayer or in service or whatever, just pick yourself up and pull up your bootstraps, as we say in American English, and just tell yourself, I'm going to fight. I'm not going to lie down. I'm going to keep on going and see what God will do. Amen? Amen? See what God will do. Truly, truly. So they stayed there a long time, preaching boldly about the grace of God. Who? I like that. I like that. So they're preaching. They're there in Iconium. But, and the Lord, and now we see something different. And the Lord proved their message was true by giving them power to do miraculous signs and wonders. This is different from Antioch. Now, were there signs and wonders in, in Pisidian Antioch? There may have been. There may have been, but it's not written. But what I want us to see is this this morning. Here, there's this opposition, and they respond by boldly preaching the Word of God. And here it says God did something special. He proved their message was true. You see, when there is opposition at times, and we stand with the Lord, and we stand for God, what we will see God do is come through in His power, in His work. We can't do it. We cannot make it happen. It's God. God does it. Now, some of you this morning say, mm, I'm a little bit uncomfortable with that, Pastor Jennifer. After all, we're educated people. Yes, but we have the Word of God, don't we? Do we have any other scripture to back this up? Uh-huh. Hebrews 2, 4. Here's something. Completely different situation. Take a look. I don't know if this is in your notes or not. And uh, the writer of Hebrews says, And God confirmed the message of salvation by giving what? Signs and wonders and various miracles and gifts of the Holy Spirit according to His will. Not because you and I can say, God, do a miracle. That's not how it works, brothers and sisters. God's God. He's the miracle worker. We are not. And as we look at this, I want you to be, I, I want to encourage you this morning. I believe that at times when there is more opposition, I believe at times when the enemy is coming harder against you, if you will stand for God, don't give up. Don't back down. Don't say, well, this is just the way it is. I guess I'll have to do something else. Keep on. Keep on standing. Keep on fighting in the Lord and watch what God will do. Some of you this morning are praying for specific answers to difficult situations. You're praying and you're saying, oh God, and you're discouraged and you feel like giving up or you feel like, well, I don't have an answer from the Lord, so I'm just going to have to do something, and so I'm going to do this. I encourage you this morning, do not give up. Continue to seek the Lord for His way, His work, and His answer in your life and in your situation, and watch what He will do. Watch what He will do. I want to say something else about this this morning. As we see this, the apostles are preaching boldly about the grace of God, and the Lord proved their message was true. What do you think Paul and Barnabas are preaching? Do you think they're preaching uh, miracles and signs and wonders? I don't think so. The Bible doesn't tell us directly. But in general, pa Paul and Barnabas, they were preaching salvation. They were preaching Jesus saves, turn away from this to this. They were preaching about God. And I personally think that's the best way to go about it. 
You preach Jesus, preach Jesus, and let God take care of these other things. And God showed, it's true, it's true. Remember, the Elamus the sor sorcerer and Sergius Paulus? Paul and Barnabas are preaching the word, and uh, Sergius Paulus listens, and then Paul says to Elimus, you child of the devil, and, and you, you're opposing everything that's right. And then God strikes him blind, and Sergius Paulus believes in God when he sees the miraculous power. Watch what God will do. Watch what God will do. What is our part? Our part is you keep praying. You keep doing what God has called you to do. Yeah? Don't worry. Don't worry, and don't get all caught up in signs, wonders, and miracles, okay? Um, study the Bible. Read the Bible. Let faith grow in your heart, but let God take care of that part. Does that make sense? Yes. Amen. Okay, so they're there. They're in Iconium, and then uh, what happens? There's a great response, and then the next thing that happens is as they're preaching, we keep on going there in Iconium, and then they find out about a plot to stone them. Now, brothers and sisters, that's persecution, right? We're going to kill them. That's persecution. It's no longer slander. They're going to kill them if they can. Uh, how many of you are keeping track of attempts on Paul's life? I am. This is number three, okay? I, I don't know if I, I don't... I don't know if I've been bold enough for the Lord that I have one attempt on my life. I don't think so, but that's okay. Paul had a special calling, and Barnabas as well. So they fled to the Lyconian towns. Now, before you say, well, I thought they were bold in the Lord. Why did they run away? Well, if you're dead, you can't preach. <laughs> right? <laughs> I, seriously. If you're dead, you can't preach. And so they said, we've got more preaching to do. So they run, okay? So they fled uh, to the Lyconian towns called Lystra and Derby. Now, just in case you're still being hard on Paul and Barnabas because they ran, uh, look at verse 7. And there they kept evangelizing. So that should encourage us this morning, right? They kept on evangelizing. And they're now in Lystra and Derby. So they're going to start here and then they're going to go here. So here we have this big loop. So here they are. So there, they kept evangelizing. And what happens as they're there, something miraculous happens. And there in Lystra, they see a man who's lame in his feet. He's never walked. And he heard Paul speaking. I love this because, again, uh, Paul is speaking. I think it's very clear from everything else we see. Paul is not talking about uh, signs, wonders, and miracles. Paul is preaching the gospel. Paul's preaching the gospel. Brothers and sisters, there's power in the gospel of Jesus Christ. There's power in the gospel of Jesus Christ. It is the power of God, as it says, unto salvation. God will take care of these other things. And here's this man. It's probably a marketplace. It's not a synagogue, as far as we know. Uh, we don't. Maybe there's not even a synagogue here. He's listening. Um, and as far as we can tell, he's never heard about Jesus before. He's never heard. He listens to Paul, and he, Paul looks at him and says, he observed him closely. He sees he has faith to be healed. Now stop there a minute. Remember we talked about gifts grow the church? How does Paul know that this man has faith to be healed? Is there a sudden glow about him, as we some, sometimes see in medieval pictures around saints and things like that? No glow, as far as I know. <laughs> I'm a poet. <laughs> um, so there's, there's nothing special. But what's going on here? Paul sees him. Here is one of the gifts of the Spirit. Discernment, yeah? It's discernment. And Paul, Paul looks at him and he says, oh, there's something there. There's something there. And so Paul says, stand up straight on your feet and walk. He jumps up and he starts to walk. So here's a miracle. And it takes place in Lystra. Wow, well, what happens next? The crowd sees what he's done. Um, and this is a pagan crowd, so they shout, they're gods, they're gods. Um, remember many years ago, I told you about mom and dad in Singapore, a very, very pagan society. And um, as mom and dad were going into one of the poor areas near the church, uh, a kampong area, kampong is, a, I think, a Malay word for like a little village area, 
it was a lot of heathen worship. These days, Singapore has many, many big churches, but in those days, very, very few churches and mostly a lot of idol worship. And mom said, who, who spoke Cantonese very well, but this was actually another dialect, say yup, was another dialect of uh, uh, an offshoot of Cantonese. As mom and dad went into this kampong area, uh, the people started shouting, um, and I, my Cantonese is not very good in this, but basically, translation was, here comes Jesus and Mary, his wife is with him. <laughs> you know? <laughs> because that was, and actually, you know, my mom's name is Mary, you know. <laughs> but all they could, the, in their limited understanding and sort of the superstitious, you know, here's the man who talks about Jesus. So, uh, here comes Jesus and Mary, his wife, is with, <laughs> and Mary, his wife, is, is with him. Um, but what happens here? Is, is truly, uh, uh, they really are worshiping them as gods, and so they decide Barnabas must be Zeus, and Paul is Hermes. Now, those of you that have lovely French uh, goods with this name, uh, I'm not mispronouncing it. This is, uh, this is uh, from mythology, and it's pronounced Hermes, okay? And they think that Paul is Hermes because he's the speaker, and Hermes was the messenger of the gods in, in mythology, okay? So that's, why he, so that's why they call him Hermes, and so they want, to, they want to sacrifice to them. May I say something to you this morning? You probably thought, well, what does this have to do with anything? I was thinking about this and praying about this yesterday. Listen, anytime God does something special and anytime God is working, do you know what the devil will do? Listen. The devil will always try to get in on God's work. Did you know that? Yes. He always will. He'll try to either take it for himself and get the glory, or he'll try to get in there and mix it up because it brings discredit to the work if the devil gets in and gets part of it. And the devil from the very beginning has always wanted glory and honor for himself, right? From in heaven, he says, I shall be like the most high. I shall, I shall. Devil hasn't changed. He still wants people's attention. He still wants people's glory. He still wants honor today. And so he stirs up. The hearts are stirred. Oh, it's, it's Zeus and it's Hermes. When Paul and Barnabas find out, they stop. They, they go shouting out among them. No, no, no. Don't do this. Don't do this. Now, look at what they say. And we're not going to spend a lot of time here because I promised you we were going to reach the end. And we're, and we're still early in chapter 14, but we're going to reach the end. Just very quickly, look at what Paul and Barnabas say to this crowd. Look carefully. We are human beings just like you. Now, would they say that to Jews? No, because Jews know that they're just humans. We have come to bring you the good news that you should turn from these worthless things and turn to the living God who made heaven and earth and the sea and everything in them. And this is what he does. I want you to see something. Because these people are Greek and Roman and they're not Jewish and they don't have a, a, a background of religion and the one true God, Paul and Barnabas don't go back and talk about Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and blah, blah, blah and all of that. No. What do they do? Paul and Barnabas talk to them coming from their perspective. And that's how you do with people. You want to talk about, you want to talk about Jesus to people? You want to share people? You want to share Jesus with people? You've got to use language and terminology and examples that people can relate to. Really, you've got to. You've got to. Uh, um, I was listening to a, a sermon one time. There was a, this was many years ago. Uh, for for uh, a true story, true story. And this evangelist who had never been outside of the U.S. had gone to India, and he was uh, there as an as an evangelist. And he was so excited to be in India. He'd never gone on an, a missions cru missions crusade before. And he was evangelizing and he was preaching, and it was really really difficult. And I think he had been in Singapore first with mom and dad. I think I think this was the pattern, and. He was there just preaching away, and he was using all these examples, and, and the person was translating, and finally the translator said to the people who were there, he said, folks, in, in, uh, in Cantonese, um, folks, I don't even understand what he's talking about. <laughs> and, then, and the man just kept on preaching, because he didn't, he didn't have the background, and he was communicating in a way they didn't understand. And then he got to India, and they were riding in a bus across India. True story. This is not a joke. And he was leaning out of the window, and he was prophesying as he was going through the countryside. And the local missionary who was with him said, what are you doing? And he said, I am declaring 
refrigerators and air conditioners for all these people as they were going through the countryside of India. I declare, I prophesy, I this and I that. And the local missionary who understood the culture said, they don't even have electricity. What are you doing? What are you doing? True, seriously, true story, true story. So brothers and sisters, know who you're talking to. Sorry, I know I'm putting a preposition at the end, but you gotta know, know your audience. Know your audience. What will touch their hearts? What will speak to them? And so that's what Paul and Barnabas do here. They don't start preaching Jewish history. They talk about God, a creator who's made them. And that's what these people can understand. And that's a lesson for us. When Pastor Renee gets back in a couple of weeks or so, uh, we're going to be having in the afternoons an evangelism class. And some of this is going to be part of it. Um, you, you talk with people in a way that they understand. And so he's, they, he barely, barely stopped them from sacrificing to them. Uh, but, you know, if the devil can't get the glory, he's going to do what he can. And so people come from Antioch and Iconium more than a hundred miles away. The devil will work hard to oppose God. Will we work that hard to honor God? Um, so they come from Antioch and Iconium. They won the crowds. They stone Paul. They drag him out of the town and they think he's dead. Some Bible translations say left him for dead. He may have been dead. We don't know exactly. Are you keeping count? What number is this? Four, okay, this is number four for Paul now. And so just as quickly as they said, oh, you're gods, they just as quickly say, you're devils. And they stone Paul and they leave him for dead. This is why, brothers and sisters, don't base your identity or your worth or your value on what people say about you and think about you because it can change just like that. Find your value and your worth in God, and that will never change. God, will lo God loves you and will love you always, and you are precious to him and honored in his sight. And so they stone Paul. They drag him out of the town. They think he's dead. And um, what happens next? But the believers gathered around him, and he got up and he went back into the town. When we read this, we overlook something that's miraculous here. Look with me. We, we overlook that whatever happens right here is truly a miracle. Paul has been stoned and left for dead. If he has been stoned, it is likely that there were broken bones and other things. They gather around him, surely to pray, and Paul gets up and he goes back into the city. That's a miracle isn't it? That's a miracle. And we overlook that because it just says, oh, he got up and he went back into the town. What a surprise it would have been for those who thought they had killed Paul. He goes back into the town. What an encouragement for these new believers to see the power of God at work in the face of, op of opposition. Amen? Amen? Amen. So he goes back into Derby, and then they go on to Lystra, the next day. Look with me very quickly as we look at this part and we're coming to a close. They travel 40 miles from Lystra to Derby. It's 40 miles. That had to be a miracle because he'd just been stoned the day before. It would have taken two or three days walking to get there, but he's able to make it to the next town. I don't know about you, but if I had been Paul in this situation, I might have decided <clears throat> Time to go home, right? How many of us would have said, okay, we've done our duty. Let's go back to Antioch now where they love us and where they will take care of us and where I can have some rest. No, they keep on going, don't they? They go next to Derby. And Derby is the turnaround town. And I love this because they don't say much, but it just says after they had evangelized that town, Derby. Now, if you looked at the maps, and we're not going to go back to the maps because we're coming to a close in the next few minutes. If you look at your maps, you will see that not too far from Derby, there's another big city. And the name of that city is, nearby, nearby city, the name of that city is Tarsus. Why is Tarsus important? That was Paul's hometown. That was Paul's hometown. 
that really spoke to me. And we don't even notice it so much in the Bible. You know, they didn't, Paul could so easily have said, okay, we finished, come on. Let's just go on. We can go to Tarsus, and then right down from Tarsus was Antioch, the home again. But they don't do that. Do you know why? They've reached the end of the journey, but the work is not yet finished. Because Jesus did not just say, go and tell people about me and get them saved. What did Jesus say? Go and what? Bingo. Make disciples. It is not always that hard to get people just to say, oh yeah, okay. It's easy to raise a hand in a crowd, isn't it? It's easy to say, oh yeah, yeah, this sounds like great news, I believe. It is another thing to stay with that person, to disciple them, to make sure that their roots are going down in Jesus, to make sure that they're then growing up in the Lord. That's another thing. That's another thing. And Paul and Barnabas knew a lot of people have gotten saved, but we got to make sure they are discipled. And so what do they do? They returned to Lystra. Wait a minute. What happened in Lystra? Stoned and left for dead. What happened in Iconium? A plot against their lives and they ran out of time. What happened in Pisidian Antioch? A mob runs them out of town. But what do they do? We're going back where opposition has, been, has, has come against us because there's more to do for God. Don't let opposition and the world stop you from doing what God has called you to do. You do what God has called you to do and finish the work. Finish the work. And so they go back and what do they do? They strengthen the hearts of the disciples by encouraging them to continue in the faith. Who does that? Who is the member of this team that's the encourager? Come on. Barnabas. The encourager. Okay, Paul, the preacher. Here comes Barnabas now, and he's the encourager. This is his gift. So this is what he does. And he strengthens their hearts by encouraging them to continue in the faith. And what? And by telling them, <laughs> you should laugh when you read this. Have you ever looked at this before and thought how ironic? He, they strengthen their hearts by what? By telling them, you're going to have trouble now that you're a Christian. To make it to heaven, it's not going to be easy. Listen, brothers and sisters, may I say something to you this morning? There must be, you and I must have a theology of suffering in our lives. Got it? It's not always easy. And if you are, if, if the only thing you hear from us in the pulpit or the only thing that your pastors tell you is, I bless you, I, pray, I praise you, it's going to be great, I declare you the head and not the tail. Now, all of that's in the Bible. I, it's true, and I'm, I, well, I should say I'm not making fun, I am making fun. Um, because those things are true, but the other part is also true. We will go through difficulties. We will go through hard times. And do you know why I need to preach it, and you need to hear it and receive it? Because if you've never heard that before, when hard times come your way, you will want to give up and you'll say, well, I don't want to be a Christian. You mean I've got to, it's going to be hard? I thought the Lord's going to bless me. I thought everything's going to be easy now. I thought it's going to be kind of like now I have Santa Claus in my life. And a lot of people think that. A lot of people think that. But I want to encourage you, brothers and sisters. I want to encourage you. This is part of the Christian life. It's part of the Christian life. But what I want you to see also is this. You and I and the disciples and all of these, we will make it into the kingdom of God. We will make it. Will we pass through troubles? Yes, we will. But brothers and sisters, you will pass through them. You will pass through them. You won't be stuck in them. You won't die in them. You won't drown in them. You won't be burdened under them forever. With God's help, you will pass through through them. Be strengthened in your heart as you hear that. I mean it. I mean it. And if you say, I'm having trouble with that, you come see me after the service and you come this afternoon to prayer time and we'll pray for you so that your heart 
can be encouraged, can be encouraged. You will pass through the trouble, pass through troubles. That's part of it. That's part of it. Paul went through attempts on his life. There was number four, and he was stoned. And then they go on back through. What else do they do? When they had appointed elders in every church and prayed with fasting. Why? There needs to be some organization, doesn't there? There needs to be, okay, we, we've got to, we want to do things right. There needs to be leadership. And so they go back through the churches and they realize there's the gift of leadership here. Oh, this person has the gift of teaching. This person has the gift of encouragement. And they fast and pray again. God, is this you? God, is this your direction? Because these people are going to lead the church. It's important. Never, ever, ever, never would we ever want to have leadership in the church that is based on human ability alone. Never. It's God's church. And so they fast and they pray. And they appoint elders. They prayed with fasting. And then they did what? They committed them to the Lord. And that can settle their hearts. Why? Why? You cannot keep anybody saved. Did you know that? Do you ever worry about people at times? Oh, I'm a whatever. You can't. Commit people to the Lord. Pray for them. Do your part. But it is the Lord who will keep them in response to their obedience in their hearts. Amen? And they committed them to the Lord in whom they had believed. They hadn't believed in Paul and Barnabas. Don't get stuck on human leadership. Don't honor Christian superstars too much. Listen. Believe in the Lord. He will keep you. He will keep you. If the day comes when Pastor Renee is gone and Pastor Jennifer is gone from this church, the Lord will keep you. Uh, by the way, I'm not prophesying. I'm not, <laughs> I'm not preparing the ground. Bye-bye. <laughs> okay. Although I am going to be back in the States to take care of Dad for a few weeks. Coming up shortly. Listen, it's the Lord in whom you have believed. He will keep you. He will keep you. And so then they go back. And here we go. Thank you for your patience this morning. We're just a few minutes over. You see the yellow. They've gone back. They go back to Lystra. So look at the green now. They go back to Ico Lystra, stoned. He goes back, establishes Iconium, run out of town. There was a plot. Antioch, run out of town by a mob. They go back down to Perga, Italia. And then what do they do? All the way back to Antioch all the way back to Antioch. And what happens when they get there? They report to the church. Oh, what? I wish I could have been in that meeting. I wish I could have been in that meeting. But may I say to you, God does wonderful things through the ministry and the missions and the outreach of Lighthouse too. We have seen it. God does wonderful things. It is not just in the book of Acts. It is today. It is now. And you and I are part of it. And what does it say? They reported everything God had done through them. Oh, that's got it right, isn't it? That's got it right. God had done it through them. As I was praying for you this morning, coming in and praying for this time, I really, I, one of my prayers was, oh God, today, would you do something in our hearts? Because God, I can't do it. You have to do it. You have to do it. God is the one who does it. And it ends with, and they stayed there a long time with disciples. That's the end of chapter 14, brothers and sisters. Be encouraged. Be, oh, there's so much more there, but I promised you we're going to finish this morning. Be encouraged by all these things that we looked at, that we've looked at these last few weeks. They finished the work that God had called them to do, and that's how we started out. If you're discouraged, hang in there. Whatever God has called you to do, whatever God has called you to be, and you're not that yet, or you're struggling with it, hang in there. Hang in there. Commit yourself to the Lord in whom you have believed, and you'll make it through. You're going to have to go through troubles? Uh-huh. So am I. But we'll make it through. We'll make it through. Amen. Let's close in prayer. Hallelujah. Amen. Lord, we thank you for Paul and Barnabas who remained faithful. God, we read about them, and we think, well, God, I, I don't know if I could have done that. I might have been John Mark. But, Lord, you haven't called us to be John Marks. You've, you've called us to make it through. And we thank you for your word that prepares us and equips us through the power of your spirit to do what you've called us to do, to be who and what you've called us to be. Thank you, Lord, that we can have boldness and confidence in you, and you will see us through. In Jesus' name.
Amen. 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 God 